Okay, so uh, then we can start the afternoon session. So we are <clears throat> uh, very happy to have Alessandro Galvani, uh, who is going to tell us about something which is not maybe directly related to the major topic of this week, which is the um, American form of bootstrap introduction, but it's a uh, it's, uh, thought-provoking result about conformal field theory, so I think we should listen to it and try to understand it. So please, Alessandro, go ahead. All right. So hello, everyone. First of all, uh, let me thank uh, the organizers for having me here. I'm a PhD student at CISA, and um, I'm working with Andrea Trombettoni and Giacomo Gori, who in some way managed to delay the birth of his own daughter just to be here today. So uh, I would like to tell you something a bit uh, the all the things that we've been working on, which, uh, as uh, Slava mentioned, are not uh, directly related to the conformal bootstrap. So, in a sense, it's a bit of a break from the topic of uh, this week and the future weeks. Uh, but it still uh, tackles, uh, in a sense, uh, many of the same uh, systems. So, uh, this is the plan of the talk. Uh, first, I will introduce our main uh, hypothesis, which is uh, which we call the uniformization. And uh, it's, um, it applies to uh, bounded domains at the critical point. And we will see what the consequences of this uh, hypothesis are. So this will lead us to uh, a equ uh, differential equation, which is called the Yamab equation for a metric that we introduce in our systems. And then this equation can be solved in some cases, and it can be exploited to obtain uh, correlation functions for the fields uh, present in our theories. Then we'll see how this equation by itself is not enough to describe uh, models who have uh, uh, an unvanishing anomalous dimension. And so we will have to tweak it a bit and obtain what is called as the uh, is called fractional Yamag equation. We will first uh, define what we mean by this, how we can compute a fractional derivative. And then we'll see how this uh, equation can uh, uh, be used to obtain a magnetization profile and the point correlation in uh, some of the most uh, uh, well-studied cases, that is the three-dimensional easing and the uh, XY models. Uh, after that, uh, we will then uh, study the case of uh, three-dimensional percolation, and uh, we will use this same approach to obtain uh, an order parameter profile from which we can uh, extract the uh, scaling dimension of the order parameter field, and uh, therefore the uh, anomalous dimension of uh, three-dimensional percolation. And then we'll see a bit what uh, uh, is still uh, uh, left to be done, what we have started working on recently. So uh, I guess that uh, the first thing I should mention why we are so interested in bounded critical system. So there are quite a few reasons why one would want to focus their attention on systems with boundaries. The most obvious one is that all real, real world systems and therefore also all numerical simulations deal with uh, uh, finite systems, which uh, in a way always have uh, boundaries. And so it's uh, quite important to find a way to take them into account. This is particularly important once we are at the critical point. Since outside the critical point, you can only feel the effect of the boundary well, up a, a few lattice sites uh, into the bulk. But once the relational length diverges, the presence of the boundary can also be felt quite deep uh, within the bulk. Of course, there are then many techniques which can exploit the finite uh, size of this system to uh, compute uh, bulk universal quantities. And there is also quite a rich field of uh, phenomena which only appear in uh, uh, systems which uh, have uh, boundaries. In particular, we are going to focus uh, on systems which have fixed the boundary conditions. So uh, taking as an example the case of a slab, which is the one that we will use most, mostly, we can, uh, in the lattice uh, case, uh, so in, in a spin model, say, uh, we can fix uh, the, the values of the spins on both of the two boundaries to be aligned. And this, after uh, rescaling, corresponds in the field theory to a diverging order parameter at uh, the two boundaries. So um, now we can get to our main hypothesis. So if uh, we were to explain to a layman what we mean by conformal, seam, conformal invariance, why we think it's uh, so important, we could say something like it's a uh, very useful property to have because it means that 
every uh, point in space uh, has effectively the same property and, and there are no privileged points. Of course, once a boundary is introduced, this property is at least partly lost since we now have a distinction between points close to the boundary and points farther away in the bulk. The question that we are trying to answer is, is it possible to uh, put uh, the bulk and the boundary back on the same hook and give them back uh, the same properties? And uh, with our um, hypothesis of uniformization, this is possible by introducing a metric which is tailored so that uh, the uh, boundary is put infinitely far away from any point in the system. So we no longer have a distinction between points close to the boundary and points which are further away. Of course, uh, we still want to uh, preserve the local properties of the system after we have introduced this metric. So this means that the metric must still uh, be uh, uh, it must still be locally Euclidean, so we can only allow conformal transformations, conformal changes starting from the uh, original flat metric. And uh, then we have this uh, idea of making the system uh, uniform homogeneous, which has to translate uh, in uh, some property of this metric. So we can compute a few measures of curvature, uh, starting from uh, the metric that we have introduced, and we want to uh, make it so one of these curvature is a constant, so that this is homogeneous throughout uh, all the system. So how do we uh, translate uh, these properties into equations? So the first thing is that we start with our flat uh, Euclidean matrix, that IJ, and then we modify it just by allowing conformal changes into this new metric, GIJ. So uh, we can only allow changes by using uh, delta J times a function of the points uh, X. And uh, we decide to uh, call this function one over gamma squared. This is done so that uh, gamma of X has the role of a point dependent uh, length scale, which then uh, it's a scale that changes throughout the system. So uh, now the other requirement is that we want to make uh, some measure of curvature constant. The, um, for the most intuitive uh, uh, choice, the one that I imagine most people would pick, uh, would be uh, the Ricci scalar curvature. So let's start uh, with that and let's see where we end up. So starting from our metric G, just as a reminder, we can compute, of course, the Christoffel symbols. And then from then, from then on, we can compute the Riemann curvature tensor, afterward the Ricci curvature tensor, and then we contract the two indices, and we are left with the Ricci scalar curvature, which, uh, as we said, we want to uh, set uh, to a constant value. Constant and what? Well, we cannot pick a positive constant value because that would mean that our system is equivalent to, say, uh, to a sphere, but a sphere has no boundaries, so it wouldn't be suitable for our purposes. We, of course, cannot choose uh, a value which is uh, zero because that would mean that we haven't really gone anywhere. We are just uh, back to our original metric. So what we are left with is to pick a uh, uh, a value of the curvature which is constant and negative. And then without uh, loss of generality, we can set this value to be uh, minus one. So if we do this, we can rewrite this equation, which now is written for the metric G, as a, a constraint on this uh, function gamma of x. Once uh, uh, we do this, we have uh, what is uh, not that well known to physicists, but uh, well known to geometers which is called the Yamab equation, which uh, after some uh, tweaking will be uh, the main equation of this work, uh, the main object that we are uh, uh, studying. So uh, this is a, a nonlinear differential equation. Uh, here, this is a Laplacian. Uh, soon it will become clear why I chose this symbol rather than the square. And of course, since this is a problem that has been tackled by a mathematician, there is a more general way to frame it uh, compared to what I said so far. And the uh, more general way is uh, uh, what they call the Yamaba problem. And it goes something like, say you have a smooth manifold and you have defined a Riemann metric onto this manifold. The problem is, is it uh, possible to uh, find another metric which is in the same conformal class as the original metric, meaning we go from one to the other just with the conformal changes. Uh, which uh, makes the scalar curvature constant uh, throughout uh, uh, the entire system. And this problem has been solved. So the, the answer is uh, yes, it's, it can be done so long as the manifold is uh, compact. So now, of course, there would be uh, two questions that immediately emerge. So uh, first one, can we solve this equation? And then what do we do with it? So let's start from uh, uh, can we solve it? So there are uh, some cases in which uh, 
this equation allows for quite uh, simple solutions. Generally, they are the ones where uh, uh, some symmetry in our domain uh, simplifies the Laplacian to uh, just a uh, uh, second derivative in uh, one of the coordinates. So the by far the simplest case is that we have space and it is valid in uh, any dimension. Now, uh, gamma only depends on the transverse direction, x1, the distance from the boundary. And the solution is as simple as they come, it's simply uh, the distance from the boundary. Another uh, quite a simple case is that of a ball. It, again, this is valid in any dimension. Uh, the gamma now only depends on the radial coordinate, and we have another simple solution. One thing that uh, one can notice is that in these two cases, uh, gamma always vanishes on the boundary, and this will uh, come in handy later. In these two cases, I should also stress that uh, uh, we are actually constructing a hyperbolic space, which makes constant not, not just this uh, scale of curvature, but uh, any other possible um, definition of curvature. And uh, a third case, which is uh, slightly more complex, but also more interesting, is the one of a slab. Here, again, we have uh, only one uh, uh, interesting uh, direction, so the one transverse to the slab, x1. All the other coordinates are parallel to the slab. This, again, we can find a solution for any dimension d. But in this time, uh, if we want a general solution, we can only express it through its inverse function. So we don't have a gamma of x, but we can obtain an x of gamma, which is written as a hypergeometric function. Luckily, for the dimensions which are of a more physical interest, so for d equal to 3, 4, and 6, it is possible, though not always immediate, to uh, invert this function and obtain gamma of x. So now we have seen a few cases in which uh, this, this equation can be solved. Now for the important question, which is, well, what do we do with this, uh, this solution? Well, um, this, um, as we mentioned, uh, gamma is the, our only length scale in the system. So if we uh, rescale the entire domain from, by a constant factor lambda, uh, gamma transforms predictably, so it gains uh, simply a factor of lambda. Can I ask a question? I, I'm a bit confused. So, uh, the uh, when uh, there is just one variable, it is slab geometry. Yes. Uh, you. So in in the other cases, like for example, in the half space, when we also had this uh, translation variance along x two uh, the directions you found a solution which was d independent so gamma equals x1 and this made sense yes well in this case i see a solution which is actually depends on d non-trivially or uh, is it oh, no it's just gamma it's just the function gamma uh, what is the function gamma of x uh, it does it depend on d or not yes uh, the the solution gamma of x uh, depends on d and indeed we have uh, uh, quite uh, different forms uh, once we invert it. So in two dimension, gamma of x is simply a uh, cosine, or a sine depends on where you place the boundaries. In any case, it vanishes uh, at two boundaries. While uh, in dimension, say, four and six, uh, gamma of x uh, is a bit more complicated. It's, a, it's an elliptic function. And in dimension three, it's even more complicated. It's a combination of uh, elliptic function. So yes, it's um, even though uh, again here we still have uh, translational invariance in all directions but one, so this lab is infinite in the other directions. Uh, but the solution is uh, uh, more complicated than just the half space. Okay, thank you. So um, now we have seen that the um, function gamma transforms uh, linearly by our scaling of the domain against the factor of lambda. And also we know how scaling fields transform if we rescale the domain in the same way. Here we consider in particular one point function, which uh, in general can be non zero since as I mentioned we are dealing with a fixed boundary condition. So, for instance, the uh, one point function of the order parameter is uh, non vanishing. And uh, they transform by gaining a factor lambda to, of course, the um, scaling dimension of the field. So, if uh, uh, so, the consequences of our uniformization hypothesis are that the, the, we can uh, then obtain uh, an expression for one point function and then also uh, some information about two and three and so on. 
higher order correlations. So one point functions are entirely determined up to a multiplicative constant alpha, uh, since they have to contain gamma of x to the correct exponent. And we can also say something about, uh, say, two point functions. So they will have to have uh, to ensure the correct scale in this uh, factor, gamma in point x and in point y, again to the correct exponent. And then there is, of course, a function of the distance between the points. Following our hypothesis of the uniformization, uh, the system no longer uh, remembers, in a sense, about the original flat metric. And so uh, the distance between these two points must be computed not with the flat Euclidean metric, but rather with the, the metric that we have introduced that contains uh, our function gamma. So here yes, is a, a yeah, yeah. This, this uh, you know, according to what we know about conformal theory, this would be true. The, this conjecture that you're formulating now for the one point function, it's equivalent to saying that you know, in, in, on the manifold with the transformed met, metric, the one point function phi of x is a constant. Because, because we know that uh, one point function transforms on the wild transformations, we know how it transforms. So what you are saying here, this phi of x equals alpha of gamma x delta phi is exactly equivalent to saying that with the transform metric phi of x, phi of x is a constant. Well, uh, if, uh, well, uh, if I understood the question, no, I mean, we still uh, have uh, the, the points uh, even though we change the metric, but we still uh, have the same uh, geometry, access the same meaning as before. So we can, for instance, obtain, uh, say, a magnetization profile uh, in a slab or a half space. Yeah, yeah, I understand a slab, but I'm saying that this equation is equivalent to saying that the one point function in the transformed geometry, you introduce this transformed metric, which was G that you call G, and it was equal to yes. delta IJ divided by gamma of X squared. So I'm saying that this equation that you are writing here is exactly equivalent to saying that in the transformed geometry, one point function phi of x is a constant. Oh, OK. Well, what we do is actually to um, change uh, the domain itself. Uh, so if we uh, were to map uh, to make a conformal transformation to the entire domain, then uh, I, I believe that that uh, could be the case. But now we are, uh, the, the domain is still the same, doesn't change. We are just uh, changing the metric uh, in the same domain. No, I'm so, saying, do you know how one point function of the field phi transforms on the wild transformation? It's a basic question of conformal field theory. Yes. So it transforms by this factor gamma x to the delta phi. So if, if that equation is correct, then in the transformed geometry, it's going to be constant. Yes or no? I think so. I think so. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. But, but since you are saying that the transformed geometry is not a homogeneous space, mm -hmm. why is there any reason to expect that uh, it's uh, in the transformed geometry, the one point function should be a constant? Because yes, a constant, the it would be a constant if the transformed geometry would be a homogeneous space. Yes, uh, but in a sense, this is what we posit. I think this, you're rephrasing what is our main, uh, uh, our main hypothesis. Yeah, this uniformization. I agree, Slava. Uh, okay, so, well, anyway, so that maybe is part of the puzzle. So why should something like that be true, assuming that the transform geometry is not homogeneous? But okay, anyway, let's keep going. Oh, oh, hi, I'm, I'm going to ask Jen. Actually, I, I like a clarification. So that's a one-point function with which metric? With J or delta? Uh, the the in a sense uh, the, the metric is only changing to obtain uh, this function gamma. So the, our points uh, x are the same as they were originally. Yeah, but okay. Let, let, let's consider a simple situation like the half space you were mentioning. Yes. It, is this one point function on the flat high space on the hyperbolic half space? Which which one? It's, uh, uh, well, we introduced the metric of uh, the, the curve metric to compute uh, gamma. Once we do that, uh, this is the value of uh, pi in uh, the original uh, uh, flat space. 
Oh, okay, thanks. So, so, so this is uh, introduced. The, the metric doesn't change the, the system as a whole. We just use it to determine uh, this, this function of gamma. All right. So, okay, it's with a flat metric. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, once uh, and then we can also, uh, so uh, as I said, we can uh, also obtain the two point correlation function up to an unknown function of the distance computed uh, with this metric. But this seems, uh, uh, in a sense, too, too good to be true. Uh, ind indeed, uh, by itself, the gamma equation uh, is equivalent to uh, an infield treatment of, uh, so it's effectively the subtle point of an ON theory at the upper critical dimension. And so by itself, it's not enough to describe models which are below the upper critical dimension. So uh, in order to see this, uh, let's now consider while this previously uh, we had uh, a generic field file that now focus on the order parameter field. If we are at the upper critical dimension DC, then the dimension of the field file is simply d minus 2 over 2. So take the uh, simplest example of a 5 4 theory in four dimension that the file is 1. In this case, we can uh, rewrite the gamma equation rather than an equation for uh, gamma as an equation for the magnetization, uh, uh, so which is the average of the order parameter. If we do this, we obtain that the Yamab equation can be recast in this form, which is uh, nothing but the uh, saddle point equation for an ON theory. So if you say you replace uh, D by 4, so the upper critical dimension of a 5 4 theory, you get Laplacian of M proportional to M cube, which is indeed the saddle point of a 5 4 theory. You can do the same for a 5 6 or a 5 3 theory at the corresponding upper critical dimensions. So this means that the Yamab equation by itself is not enough since it cannot account for the anomalous dimensions of the field. So can we fix it? Well, uh, the, what makes sense to do at this point, what we did is to uh, change in a sense the exponent. Here we had d minus 2 over 2, which is dimension if uh, the anomalous dimension is uh, 0. We can change exponent in order to account for the anomalous dimension as well. So here delta phi also includes the anomalous part eta. And then, of course, we also have to uh, change it similarly on the right hand side. But now we get an equation which does not scale correctly. The, the dimensions aren't right. So we have to fix it. And in order to do so, we can also change the exponent of this uh, Laplacian here. And what we end up with is a fractional Laplacian. So uh, this is uh, known to Geometers as the fractional gamma equation. Um, here it's a uh, different multiplicate constant, which is uh, not important for our purposes. And now there are, of course, quite a few questions that have to emerge. Uh, how do you define this operator? Does this still have a geometric meaning? So the first thing is that there is still a geometric interpretation to uh, this uh, equation. Which is uh, rather... I'm sorry, Sandra, you went really too fast on this fractional Yama equation. Yeah, uh, it's really uh, yes. Yeah, okay, so, so can you spend a bit more time on this slide? I didn't. Okay, so uh, the idea is to modify the uh, original Yama equation, which I guess now we should call integer Yama equation to uh, to avoid confusion with the previous uh, uh, with the um, with the new one that we are introducing and. Uh, while we previously had uh, d minus 2 divided by 2 here as the exponent, now since we want to take into account the anomalous dimension, we change it to, uh, to a delta phi, which can now include the uh, anomalous dimensions of the field. And then uh, what we do, which I understand may seem uh, a bit uh, unconvincing at first, is to uh, change also the uh, exponents on the other terms. Can you explain yeah. what fixes the powers? Uh, why is it, for example, in the left hand side at minus delta phi and in the right hand side is delta phi minus d? What fixes these powers? Why do you want these powers? Well, uh, uh, this uh, is uh, so it can. Uh, uh, well, the first thing is that, of course, if we replace delta phi by the uh, by d minus two over two, we want to recover the uh, original, uh, so the integer in equation, what we previously had. And um, uh, then uh, there, uh, another argument would be that if uh, we choose uh, these powers, then this equation still has a geometric interpretation, which is that of now making another definition of curvature, 
which is called the fractional two curvature rather than the simpler which is clear curvature constant no i guess I, what i didn't understand is that you said okay fractional mm -hmm. you said the integer yamaha equation had the problem you said okay it was only mm -hmm. valid for three theories so you have to modify it there are infinitely many ways to modify this equation why do you choose this particular way that delta phi for example why do you choose to modify the exponent both in the left hand side and in the right hand side of gamma of x? Well, like, for example, can't I just modify in the left hand side and then uh, I still can use the usual Laplacian? Uh, well, uh, by doing this change, it can still uh, be interpreted as, uh, although this is not what we are going to do, but it can still be interpreted as the uh, subtle point of just a different action. So we want. Uh, the exponent here to still be minus delta phi so that this part is uh, still the uh, magnetization. So this is still the average of the order parameter. Okay, and why what about the right hand side? Uh, the right hand side uh, could be obtained, uh, say you have uh, an, an action which is of the form some uh, quadratic part with the fields uh, by on left and right of this operator. And then you have uh, something which has the role of a uh, potential, so some phi to some given power. From that, uh, if you want to uh, obtain, say, the, uh, the average, so the, the magnetization, you, what uh, you would end up with is an equation which has this same shape, except that you wouldn't have the gamma, you would have phi to the in the, here to the one, and uh, the right hand side will be obtaining, obtained by basically uh, doing the same uh, thing on the potential, say taking a derivative with respect to phi. And so you can, uh, if you start from an equation which contains phi and then replace it, so whenever you have phi replaced by gamma of x to the minus delta phi, you would end up with uh, uh, something like this. Uh, so, I guess it, I, I, sorry. It, it, isn't this? Oh, sorry. I just wanted to add. Maybe it's it's easier to say it should be the conjugate field. You have on the left hand side the magnetization, and on the right hand side you would like to have something that looks like a field, the conjugate field. I don't know if if it's everything that uh, Alessandro just said, but to put it in more uh, in a shorter form. So isn't the, the top equation just the equation? If I wanted to compute the the VEV of in lambda phi four theory. Isn't this just the equation that box phi is equal to phi cubed? Yes. yes. And so in below, you're promoting box to the fractional Laplace. So actually, this would be the mean field equation for something called the, the long range easing model, I believe, where it's, it's the theory where you still have lambda phi fourth, but that the kinetic term is described by, by a fractional Laplacian. So I, th I think that would be the interpretation in that case. Uh, that is true, although it's not the interpretation that we are uh, uh, looking after, looking for, in the sense that, indeed, uh, starting from uh, that, uh, we will get uh, exactly this equation, but we're not claiming that now this is uh, the subtle point of that kind of action. So we are uh, just saying that if uh, our uniformization hypothesis is true, then we are led to this equation, and uh, correlation functions can then be computed by using uh, this equation. However, I, I agree. So we, in the easing long range, you would have the Laplacian with a, fra with a fraction, uh, with exponent which depends on the power law of the, the decay. Yes. I think, yeah, I think this equation, so for when the, when, when the coupling is small, so if you tune the, 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 this, this power in the fractional Laplacian such that phi fourth is weakly relevant, this is literally the mean field equation in that theory, so. Yes. I'm confused, how, but now you're gonna give it a different interpretation, I'm confused. Uh, well, yes, uh, we are, uh, uh, in, in a sense, uh, we are not claiming that we know what the action that uh, produces the, this equation is. Uh, so uh, we want to apply this uh, to a few uh, cases like uh, three-dimensional easing and so on, and then percolation, for which uh, this is not uh, to be considered as a subtle point uh, of, a, um, of an action with a fractional notation. It's, uh, it's I guess what I'm saying is that in that case, it's not a conjecture. It's just, you know, there's the, that you have this theory, 
And there's an epsilon expansion for this theory. And literally, uh, the mean field equation in that theory is that. You don't have to conjecture anything. Yeah, that's the reason why we need to make uh, this conjecture is that uh, we uh, don't, we are not uh, looking at this equation as uh, uh, the I mean field uh, for, say, long range uh, um, systems. It's but, uh, uh, while it is the is same that... equation, we don't believe it uh, comes from the same action. So the actions for the models that we are working on, is, so say the three dimensional easing, we don't know what the action is. We just uh, we're just claiming that uh, one and two point function can be described by this equation. So I guess the, the, the conjecture is that this equation might be justifiable for the long range theories. And now you are going to postulate it for short range theories. And you claim that nevertheless, miraculously, it somehow still has anything to do with these theories. Yes. And I guess the proof of the pudding is in is in the simulations that you're going to show. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, what we have uh, the fractional notation that we've obtained. It does the geometric interpretation of making a fractional key curvature constant. And now, of course, uh, uh, one would uh, want to know maybe what uh, this uh, operator is. Uh, there are, of course, uh, many uh, different definitions of the fractional Laplacian. So long as uh, we are in an infinite R3D uh, space, they're all equivalent. But sadly, it won't be the case uh, for, uh, for us. So uh, most of the time, we can think of a Laplacian operator as just a multiplication by k square in Fourier space. And indeed, this definition generalizes quite easily. So we can, if we want to compute the fractional Laplacian of this function f, we can take a square transform multiply by k to the 2s, and then invert the Fourier transform. And indeed, this is the fractional fraction of f. An alternative definition that we see here uh, uses uh, an integral of something which uh, looks like is reminiscent of an incremental ratio. In uh, both these cases, we see that this operator is uh, non-local. So unlike uh, ordinary derivatives, one needs to know the value of the function across the entire space, which is the uh, problem that we now encounter since uh, we are uh, considering bounded domains. So these integrals cannot be performed over the entire space. And so uh, all the various groups of equivalency between the different definitions are no longer valid. So we need to find a definition which is suitable for our purposes. And um, this is just uh, to give uh, an, an idea of uh, what we actually need to do. Um, so the, the best definition is to consider fractional Laplacian as an extension problem. So here to uh, make the calculation a bit more clearer, I will just uh, focus on the case of the square root of the Laplacian, although this can be extended to uh, different powers. So our original uh, domain is uh, omega, a uh, dimensional domain on which the function f is defined. And then uh, we have to extend this to a uh, d plus one dimensional space. So this is the extended space theta which is uh, obtained by uh, introducing an auxiliary variable y. And uh, on the boundary, so for, well, for y equals 0, we uh, recover our original space uh, omega. Once we have this uh, construction, the difficult part is to define a harmonic function u on this entire space uh, theta. And f will serve as boundary condition for this function u. What we mean by that is that the uh, this function is harmonic, so the Laplacian in d plus 1 dimension uh, vanishes. And also uh, u for uh, y equals 0, so uh, reduces to our original function f. If we can define a function uh, like this, then it's quite easy to compute the fractional Laplacian, well, the square root of Laplacian, since uh, it's simply uh, minus the derivative along this auxiliary direction of the new function u computed for y equals 0. And why would that be the case? Well, this uh, is the square root of Laplacian, which should mean that if we apply it twice, we have to get back to the original Laplacian. So if we do this operation twice, we get uh, this uh, second derivative in the direction y. But we can then exploit the fact that this function is a harmonic. So the second derivative alongside the direction y is the opposite of the Laplacian in the other g directions. And uh, now we can use the boundary condition here. And this means that we have the Laplacian in d dimension of uh, our original function f of x. So in a sense, the square root of the Laplacian can be interpreted as a Dirichlet Neumann operator, 
because we start with uh, a function which has a Dirichlet clay boundary condition, so we know the value of the function and the boundary, and we end up uh, reading off the Laplacian from the uh, derivative of the boundary, which corresponds to a Neumann boundary condition. So what uh, we then have to do to modify this for our for our case uh, is uh, a bit more well convoluted since we now have to consider the fact that we are living in a bounded domain. So uh, if uh, someone, some of you is later interested, I'll try and explain uh, these uh, details, uh, but uh, I, I won't uh, bore everyone else. So uh, in a sense, we have now uh, by using by doing this managed to uh, solve the fractional Yamab equation. And uh, one thing to notice is that uh, now the equation itself uh, depends uh, on delta phi. So we would have a solution for every value of delta phi. And luckily, it's possible to obtain a solution which varies continuously with uh, delta phi. So for um, uh, most the system that we are interested in, the exponent of the Laplacian, which is uh, 1 minus uh, half of the anomalous dimension, is uh, very close to 1 because, as you know, it's, uh, the anomalous dimension for, say, three-dimensional easing or XY or even percolation models, they're all uh, uh, pretty small, which means that uh, this uh, fractional operator is quite close to the uh, integer Laplacian. And indeed, this means that the solution of the fractional Yamab equation is not that different from the solution of the integer Yamab equation. Here you can see the difference between the two as the phi varies for, from 0.5, so the case with no anomalous dimension, to a value of 0.54, which is uh, quite uh, large compared to, say, here, the correct value for three-dimensional is in class. And we see that the difference between the two is simply uh, of the order of 10 to the minus 3. So one might even wonder, is it worth it to do all of this uh, just to get a, a solution which is very different? Well, we'll see that, indeed, it's, uh, it's worth it since the numbers to get will be uh, much better. So as a test of this, we perform some Monte Carlo simulation of uh, uh, three-dimensional systems. So the, to start off, uh, we have, of course, uh, the easing model. Uh, thanks to universality, we can select a slightly different model in the same uh, universality class, which is better suited for numerical simulations. And so we use the blue Capel model. So uh, the, in each side, we can uh, have spins which are plus or minus one, but we can also allow the possibility of having uh, a vacancy in a site. And so in, uh, in practice, we have a cost of adding a, a spin to a given lattice site. So um, we performed uh, some multiple simulation for, uh, again, the geometry of a slab. So this is the transverse direction uh, X. Uh, which is of length L, and in the other two directions, which are supposed to be infinite, we notice that uh, as long as the, the other direction are six times as long as the transverse, transverse direction, the results are uh, approximately quite well the ones for an infinite slab. So we did this for the various uh, value of this uh, system size, and then we have, of course, uh, we have obtained some uh, numerical magnetization profiles across the slab, and we want to fit them with uh, this function. So of course, we have a multiplicative constant alpha in front. We have an exponent uh, delta phi, which is uh, what we're after. And then there is a third parameter, which is here the extrapolation length. This uh, always appear in uh, uh, when we have a lattice simulation in a bounded domain that we want to compare with a theoretical uh, curve. And it's there to account for the fact that uh, the divergence that uh, should appear for uh, uh, gamma uh, equals zero or L uh, will not, of course, appear on the lattice itself since the spin, the spin value cannot uh, diverge. But this divergence would appear if we were to prolong the lattice profiles up to a few sites, up to eight sites, uh, beyond the, the uh, actual boundary of the lattice. So uh, now we can, of course, uh, choose which uh, gamma we want to use, the one which- Can, we can you explain why is this uh, A over L, um, okay. why is there a linear, why is there a linear dependence why A over L and not say A over, A over L to some power? Well, uh, I could say that um, we noticed that uh, uh, if we make this choice, A seems to be uh, roughly constant. It's, 
Uh, let me think. Oh, why? It, in a sense, the, the, this, uh, uh, the, uh, how many uh, sites we need to uh, go beyond the, the boundary to encounter the divergence is something that uh, we expect to be uh, constant as the size increases. So as a fraction of the overall profile, this should shrink uh, proportionally to the increase of the size L. OK, thanks. So um, uh, now we can uh, choose a, a function gamma. What we, uh, so we know that now the correct choice should be the gamma as a function of, also of delta phi, so the fraction of the solution. But we can also check whether the solution with the integer gamma equation is uh, still sensible. So um, this is the uh, result of the fit. These are different curves for various sizes. Once they are appropriately rescaled by this factor, we see a very clear collapse of all the points one after the other. And they also uh, coincide, they match uh, this quite well, our uh, theoretical prediction. So here is the fractional Yamabe solution. So uh, for every size, then we, can, uh, uh, we did this uh, fit. And we've seen that the values of the fraction of the solution are better compared to the values for the integer of the solution. Once we use as a benchmark the most accurate uh, numerical values that are currently available. So of course, uh, everyone here again knows the uh, value for the conformal bootstrap. And also we, uh, here is the value for a uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So uh, we see that uh, while the fractional Yamaha profiles are uh, clearly more accurate, uh, the integer solution is still uh, surprisingly good uh, considering that uh, it's uh, not the wrong, uh, it's not the correct uh, choice of the function. So here is the uh, final value that we have obtained by comparing uh, the various uh, sizes. And then uh, we can do the same thing for a similar model, of course, the uh, model. Uh, we can again pick a model which has uh, vacancies. So, how, did you, how did you, excuse me, how did you obtain those extrapolations? So if I take those values, it looks like they are roughly constant from 64 to 128. Yes, and, uh, exactly. Initially for small sizes, I will explain this in more detail later for the case of population, but for small sizes, the, we see that delta phi is decreasing as a function of L. But then for the large enough sizes, all, the, all these values are compatible one with the other. So we uh, pick the values which uh, are uh, compatible in the sense that their error bars overlap. And uh, we uh, took, we actually averaged these values. Later, we'll do something a bit different because uh, the we have uh, that delta phi is still decreasing as a function of L. So this is just the, the average of the, uh, the sizes which are compatible one with the other. It's kind of funny that your error, you know, your error for 128 to 96 is basically the same. And then from 128 to 192, it shrinks by factor five. That's quite uh, Well, a, yes, quite well, this surprising. simulation took a lot more, uh, well, computing power in a sense, since it was uh, for the largest size is the one that uh, we spent the most on. It's, uh, it's possible that the, the, error, the errors would have been similar if we had dedicated the same uh, uh, computing power to all of them. But I guess yeah, so, so how much of the error is like statistic dominated? And so you're saying the error is mostly statistical dominated? Uh, well, uh, this, uh, well, these errors have been, uh, are, are, yes, are statistical errors in the sense that uh, they are obtained uh, from the fit of each uh, set of points. Uh, each fit parameter has uh, its own uh, statistical error. And yes. so these are uh, the errors that we got. Uh, and uh, well, yeah, they are indeed. If I if I can comment, uh, if you get if you go on with sides, uh, then uh, you have to deter to determine with a better precision of beta c provided by Asenbush. So if you want to put I don't know three two hundred fifty six, uh, 
Then you have to calculate with a better precision the critical value, that one. So it's also a matter of uh, that if you go on with the size, you have to go on also with the beta critical. Otherwise, you have that error. So at 192, it's okay. But if you start to go on, then you touch that problem. So um, then we. So, sorry, I have a question. When you fit, you also fit gamma, no? So it's a fit of yeah, gamma yeah. also. When uh, we do the fit approximate uh, equation, uh, delta pi appears uh, twice. It appears both as the exponent and within the function gamma. Luckily, the function gamma varies quite smoothly with uh, delta pi, so it, it varies well polynomially in delta pi, so long as we restrict ourselves to. Uh, given range. So we have a solution of uh, gamma as a function of x and delta pi, which is valid for the range uh, delta pi going from 0 0.5 to 0 0.54, which is guaranteed to include the correct value. Okay, thank you. Okay. So um, now for the x-ray model, we again use a model with vacancies and uh, rather than uh, simulating uh, continuous spins, which are uh, a lot uh, harder, and more, uh, we used a different model in the same university class, which is the end state plot model. So now spins are only allowed to take a discrete set of values. In this case, we chose eight possible values. So again, uh, all the important data sets, such as the critical inverse temperature was already determined by Hasenbusch. And uh, so we did a similar simulation. Again, we only have, uh, we only plot like half uh, of the magnetization profile since the other half being in a slab is symmetric. And so we see again, a clear collapse on the data. And this is the uh, theoretical prediction with the fractional Yamab equation. And so uh, this is the uh, result for the uh, Critical uh, for the scaling dimension that we have obtained. And again, it's uh, a comparison with the Monte Carlo result and, of course, uh, you know, the uh, conformal bootstrap uh, result. So um, after doing these two simulations, we can most uh, clearly see that uh, indeed our theoretical curves, uh, curve is quite good uh, at describing these uh, magnetization profiles. So um, just as a further check, so far we uh, were in three dimensions, so we had to use a fractional Yamab equation, but then we can also move to a four-dimensional system so that we can make sure that also the integer Yamab equation can work. In uh, this case, with the first generation of four-dimensional is a model, and uh, gamma, the solution of the integer Yamab equation, is uh, kind of written with your choice of uh, um, elliptic function. Here we use the fire stress B function that can also be written as, a, as an elliptic sign. And this time we don't have to fit the exponent, which you know is just one. So we just have to fit the constant and the extrapolation lamp. And again, we see a good uh, collapse. Uh, although this time uh, we one should also have to take into account uh, the presence of some uh, uh, logarithmic uh, finite size uh, fraction since we are exactly at the upper critical dimension. So uh, as far as magnetization profile, we are now quite convinced that uh, our conjecture makes sense. The next thing was to verify if uh, uh, the same conjecture is also valid for uh, uh, two-point uh, functions. So in this case, uh, um, what follows from our hypothesis is that uh, this ratio, so the two-point function divided by the product of one-point function, must depend on the distance between x and y computed using our metric g. So we took uh, some data points, and then we see that if we plot them as a function of the original Euclidean distance, then they are kind of scattered everywhere. There isn't any collapse. But if we instead plot these same points as a function of the distance, uh, this distance, so computed using uh, our metric, um, we see that there is a very clear collapse onto uh, one line. So this, uh, this line would be uh, the function of the an unknown function of the distance that we now know is the distance uh, between the points uh, obtained uh, with a metric. So now we can, uh, um, we of course did the same thing for the actual model and the plot is extremely similar. 
so not much to add here. And now we can finally come to the case of uh, percolation. So as well, there is uh, a lot that I could say about percolation, but I guess most people in the audience probably know more than me about the topic. So I won't uh, spend uh, much uh, time on it. Per percolation, of course, the simple statistical model, it's uh, quite easy to perform numerical simulations since we don't even have to bother with uh, uh, Boltzmann weights, acceptance probabilities, and so on. It's also quite pretty in the sense we can uh, see the fractals which emerge at a critical point. And thanks to the fact that it's uh, upper critical dimension is six, there is quite a wide range of dimensions for which uh, there are non-critical trivial exponents. Luckily, there's no need to try and look them up in some review since the Wikipedia page for the topic is uh, quite good. Here we see uh, the one, the exponent that we are interested in, the anomalous dimension theta. So we are again interested in the three-dimensional case. Uh, and of course, the simplest models that we could uh, simulate would be something like site or bond percolation. But since we're interested in uh, continuum profiles, we believe that those would not be uh, the best choice. Instead, we pick a continuum model of percolation, which uh, is obtained by simply, we are again in a slab geometry. So we simply add uh, balls uh, to the system one at a time. And uh, when two balls intersect, and that means that they belong to the same lattice. We keep doing this until we have reached uh, um, a critical filling ratio. Uh, and then, since we are considering a fixed boundary condition, that means that if any ball uh, in intersects uh, either of the two boundaries, then it, it uh, automatically belongs to the uh, boundary cluster. So here we see what happens once we add a few more balls. Um, and uh, in this case here, this uh, gray one, dark gray black one, would be the um, largest percolating cluster. So to obtain then uh, the variable that we are interested in, so the order parameter uh, profile, we can uh, cut this, uh, uh, this lab with uh, various different planes parallel to uh, the two boundaries located at coordinate x. And then the intersection between the plane and uh, all these uh, balls will give us uh, some circles. The total area of uh, these circles it was, is uh, what we call the average of the uh, one-point function phi of x at uh, a distance x from the boundary. So we would like to do this in three dimension, but uh, <clears throat> beforehand, just to make sure that our data analysis uh, is correct, we test this in two dimension. So <clears throat> in two dimension, the uh, dimension of the fields are entirely anomalous. So one would imagine that uh, one really needs the fractional Yamab equation. However, as it often happens, uh, there are uh, some ways, uh, some simplification that occurs uh, in uh, two dimension. In this case, it's the fact that uh, uh, the various uh, definitions of curvature are no longer independent. So if we find a metric that fixes the scalar curvature, then it also fixes uh, every other possible definition of curvature. And this means that even though the fields are anomalous, we are still allowed to use the integer Yamab equation for uh, the uh, two-dimensional case. And in particular, the, we have to take a limit, and the two-dimensional limit of the Yamab equation is actually a more well-known equation, we'd say, which is the uh, Uville equation. So uh, this can, uh, for instance, can easily solve this equation for the case of a half space, you, um, a plane, you will get, uh, again, a solution where gamma is the distance from the boundary. And then solving this equation in the other geometries just means mapping the half plane to uh, that, uh, that other geometry. So in our case of a slab, the solution is uh, the, the inverse of the previous solution, the hypergeometric that we had determined earlier, which into this dimension is uh, quite simple. It's just a cosine. Um, and so we can uh, then perform this uh, simulation of two-dimensional percolation for a few different sizes. Again, we see a very clear collapse. And we want to use this to extract the, uh, uh, the anomalous dimension uh, delta phi. So here we could have easily pushed the numerics to uh, larger numbers, but we wanted to see if it's possible to obtain a good value of delta phi, even though, as you can see, the points themselves are still quite uh, far away from the correct value. But if we fit uh, this function with uh, the, the value that we want plus something that decays with L, we get uh, quite an accurate prediction without really making much effort. So um, at least this procedure of after 
a fit for each data fit in then delta phi is a function of L. Simple. Sorry, sorry so, can I ask a question here? Sure. So you are into dimension, no? Yes. So I guess uh, there should be um, a way to find the W, no? Uh, there probably is, uh, I don't know what it is. And uh, in a sense, uh, the, what uh, uh, our plan is to do this in three dimension where uh, I don't know if there is a way to fix uh, W. So we wanted to see, let's assume we know basically nothing about three dimension. Even if uh, we don't know much, we can still get uh, a good value for uh, <coughs> Delta Phi. Sorry, but, but here you, you are fitting to this exact uh, D equals two uh, uh, gamma, gamma function, right? So you're, you're not using this uh, fractional Yamabe equation. Exactly. Even, even though now the dimensional fields are entirely anomalous, we can use the integer Yamabe equation, which in two dimension is the Duville equation. <laughs> and this is the exact solution of, the, of that equation in two dimension. This is uh, effectively equivalent to the map uh, from say the, the half plane to uh, a slab uh, would give you uh, the same uh, order parameter profile. So this is uh, in a sense, nothing new. We just wanted to okay, check so that. The, but, the, but this fractional Yamabe uh, conjecture of yours, you're claiming that it works in D equals three and then at some point between three and two, it stops working because I mean, this is a different solution, no? Uh, well, uh, uh, we haven't tested in D equals two, but uh, since uh, in D equal two, uh, there aren't as many uh, different uh, definition of curvature, it would make sense uh, to think that uh, we could, in theory, uh, still use the fraction, uh, the fraction of the equation into dimension, and we uh, would uh, hopefully uh, recover the, the same results. So since um, in this case, we we'll just test this now, and you can just sorry, solve no. it. Can I interrupt? Yes, sorry. Uh, it, it is a solution of the fractional Yamabe equation by construction. It is. Okay. It, it solves both this one and your fractional Yamabe equation for this precise or, choice of delta phi? Yes, because for right. two dimensional manifolds, you just need one curvature. So if you make uh, ordinary curvature constant, you get all of the fractional curvature to be constant. Okay, so it's pretty non trivial then. So then it agrees in D equals four and it agrees in D equals two and D equals three also matches. Yes. yes. Okay. We are crossing our finger in between. <laughs> okay. So uh, now we can uh, move to the three dimensional. Uh, Alexandro, I have another question. Yes. Uh, how, how do you know that the uh, subleading contribution to delta phi L is in power law? Well, uh, it seemed like a reasonable assumption. Uh, I'll, it's mostly, uh, it gives a, a good result. Uh, so we thought it would make sense uh, to use this. Uh, uh, the alternative, uh, I, I, I know this is not very convincing, but the alternatives, I, I wouldn't make as much sense, I believe. So, an exponential decay would be too fast, and the logarithmic decay also, I don't believe, would make uh, much sense. Uh, su suppose we, we choose the sublim term as c over um, c log l over l to, to w. So, um, so will the result be um, almost the same or? Well, that's a good question. I admit I haven't tested it. Uh, I believe that uh, if, uh, uh, well, one could, uh, just to be sure, add as many terms uh, as one could think of, and then the, the fit, in a sense, will decide uh, what the, the best uh, function is, uh, although that's maybe not particularly elegant. Uh, alternatively, uh, honestly, the the probably safest solution would be to perform uh, simulations for just much larger uh, sizes so that one doesn't need to perform uh, this uh, procedure at all. So if we were saying this part uh, of the plot, uh, we would already be close enough to the uh, for constant value that this fitting procedure would then uh, become unnecessary. Okay, thank you. 
Give can I can I say something? So okay, in a sense, we know we know where it's going. So now you're going to show that your proposal also works for percolation, and we are very happy for you, even in 3D. Now, assuming that uh, you don't have much time, maybe we can skip that uh, part because uh, we trust you. But so what? What's you know why why they, why is this working? That's the most interesting thing, because you came up with a proposal which, as far as <clears throat> CFT is concerned is not following from any theoretical argument that uh, I'm aware of. Can you say anything about that? Uh, well, indeed, we don't. I should say, it's, sorry, I'm interrupting. Uh, so, uh, I should say, okay, that I would suggest that you kind of, of course, you have to wrap up your talk. So, you, you, you finish your talk, but maybe you don't like. Spend too much time on percolation, and if you have anything to say about this theoretical part, then you better focus on that. If it's but, okay. Slava, at least we would like to see how precise it is. Okay, well, yeah, so maybe like let's skip the 2D talk uh, to depart uh, because, yeah, let's go to the 3D. Okay, so in the um, three dimensional case, we uh, had again the same uh, idea, so we again uh, fit this uh, data on a Slab, we have a very good collapse again, and they all collapse onto the function which is obtained by the fractional amount equation. And then we can do uh, the same thing that we uh, previously did. And we obtain, so we fit delta phi as a function of L to obtain the value for infinite L. And uh, we see that we obtain this uh, uh, result. And we also see that the function, the, the exponent obtained by the fit of L is uh, quite close to two. So if we can be uh, a bit optimistic and believe that uh, this uh, function uh, should be exactly two, then we could get uh, a more precise estimate of the same exponent, since now we have uh, one fewer fit parameters. And uh, uh, this would be our uh, result of delta phi and therefore of the uh, anomalous dimension theta. So we can now compare this with the uh, uh, previously known results, and we say that indeed it seems to be uh, it's uh, more accurate. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, basically it. So just as a brief recap, we started from a hypothesis, which uh, uh, indeed is just a hypothesis of uh, uniformization, from which uh, uh, we are led to the Yamab equation. And uh, we see that in at the upper critical dimension, we just have the simplest version, the integer Yamab equation, which is equivalent from the field approach. But below the upper critical dimension and above, uh, we get uh, the fractional Yamab equation, which we have seen uh, how to solve. And we obtain results in three dimension. Firstly, we got some uh, <coughs> critical order parameter profiles, which uh, uh, fit the data quite well. And we obtained the uh, scaling dimensions for the three-dimensional easy model, the three-dimensional again x-ray model, and the finally uh, percolation, which is uh, uh, the one uh, which is again I guess a bit more accurate than uh, previous results. Uh, and in the case of easy and xy, we also shown how the two-point uh, correlation ratio also satisfies our conjecture since they all uh, collapse into a function of the distance between the points computed with our metric. Then there is uh, still uh, uh, a lot that we have to are starting to work on. We haven't really mentioned uh, any field beside the order parameter field, but uh, the question is, can this uh, method also describe uh, other fields in the theory, say the epsilon field, the energy density? And is it possible to compute also cross correlation functions, say the correlation of the order parameter with uh, the energy density? We are still well working on this. And then another idea that we are considering is whether it's possible to do some sort of epsilon fractional epsilon expansion in the sense that for uh, uh, d equals four, if we correspond to epsilon equals zero, we have the integer of the solution, which is uh, very nice easy to obtain. And then we, since we would like to start from that and perturbatively approach d equals three, so that we could maybe solve uh, perturbatively the fractional Yamab equation without actually computing fractional derivatives, just as a perturbation around uh, the integer four-dimensional 
solution. So uh, this is uh, uh, just a couple of ideas that I'm throwing out there in a sense. So we are just starting working on them. So uh, the main talk uh, is, uh, is, was this. So uh, thank you all for your attention. And now we can, can go back to the uh, questions that were being asked. Question? In, uh, in four dimensions, uh, one expects logarithmic corrections to the exponents. You ignored these logarithmic corrections. Is there a chance that you will be able to find them? Well, in, in four dimension, yes, right. Yeah. Yes. So uh, in uh, four dimension, we did get some logarithmic uh, correction, not to the exponent itself, but uh, in uh, while doing this uh, fit here, we had uh, uh, some logarithmic correction to the order parameter itself. And so the way to uh, account for them was uh, uh, this. So basically, uh, these are what we believe to be the most uh, important terms if we are uh, in a finite system, but at the bulk critical temperature. So uh, this would be uh, uh, for uh, um, for just m as a function of the system size l. But since here m is also a function of x, so we get that this uh, correction, so b1 and b2 and b0, will have to be a function of x, or rather, to be more specific, of the rescaled variable psi once we take into account the fact that different sizes have a different extrapolation length. So what we uh, did was find uh, was a different uh, Fit, this time not uh, using x as a variable, but having fixed a uh, point uh, psi, we uh, do a fit uh, as uh, L varies to obtain values of these uh, three uh, parameters, b0, b1, and b2. And our claim would be that we, if this is correct, then of course for very large uh, system size, these terms don't matter any longer. And so we would be left only uh, with b0. So what we checked, is that uh, the B0 that we obtained for the fit, uh, a fit for every X point, so many different fits for different uh, coordinates uh, X, uh, can uh, our uh, B0 effectively reproduces the profile that we have obtained, so the integer Yamabe solution. To check whether this was uh, the case, we plotted the ratio between the square root of B0, which is supposed to be the, um, the correct uh, profile, and uh, the theoretical prediction M, which is the solution of the M of equation in D equals four. And we see that there is uh, overall good agreement up to, in some cases, uh, two uh, standard deviations. And so we believe that indeed there are some logarithmic corrections. They would go away if we were able to push the, the simulation a bit uh, further, but uh, so far they are there, but uh, they, they're still, uh, we can still manage them. So B0 is indeed what describes uh, the, um, the mean field at the sub point solution. Wouldn't you expect the function gamma also ha to have some logarithmic corrections? Well, the function gamma in D equals four is exactly equivalent uh, to the saddle point uh, uh, solution. So uh, one, so in a sense, we have that uh, Gamma doesn't have uh, corrections because it's just uh, equivalent to the subtle point, but the magnetization does have some corrections. So in a sense, it would also be possible to reframe this problem a bit more differently and say, we want the magnetization to always be gamma to the minus one. And in order to do so, gamma will be the mean field uh, solution plus uh, some uh, logarithmic corrections. But in that case, gamma would no longer solve the, uh, the integer of equation in four dimensions. Okay. I see there is a raised hand. So Jung Swan Lin, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, about this uh, uniformization hypothesis in D equals two, or I guess one plus one, in cases where you know exactly which CFT characterizes the critical phenomenon, not only is this hypothesis false, you can exactly quantify this, this uh, how false it is, right? It's just the analyst 
one point function and it's an untrivial function of the cross ratio in general. And in simple theories, it's something you can compute exactly. So can't you compute that and check like what, say like at what digit roughly that error, uh, that uh, the falsehood of the hypothesis introduces the error? Like, okay, well, uh, from what I know about uh, uh, the dimension, uh, I would say that uh, what uh, we can get uh, should be uh, correct. We just cannot get all of uh, the results from conformity theory. So in a sense, uh, if, uh, um, so all of this is only for say um, scalar fields. So if you can uh, have uh, say a one point function of a scalar field in a half plane and then map it from the plane to a different geometry, you would get a prediction from conformity theory, which is uh, the same thing that we arrive uh, with uh, our uh, uh, conjecture. So as far as at least the one point function go, this should be, uh, there shouldn't be really an, an error. For two point functions, we were only able to test this for the simplest case. So if you have uh, say a two point function of the easing model in a half plane, that can be uh, determined exactly. And uh, that function is in a sense a function of the distance by using the hyperbolic, uh, uh, of the hyperbolic distance between the points. So all of this uh, doesn't really uh, tell you all that much, this idea by itself doesn't tell us all that much about the dimension since this is, uh, uh, for instance, we cannot say anything about uh, operator product expansion uh, and all of that. So uh, all we can say is uh, what one point function would be like, uh, and this, as far as I know, should uh, uh, correctly reproduce uh, uh, boundary conformity theory results. So I agree with your statement about the one point function in half space because it maps to the disk one point function and that's fine. But if you have a, a slab, as you discussed, then it maps to an analyst one point function, which, uh, you know, the, you know, it, in this hyperbolic metric, it shouldn't be a constant. So, so that shouldn't that tell you that this hypothesis is only an approximation on an, an annulus can uh, still be done with our hypothesis. And uh, we get that uh, in, uh, in this, uh, this is only by in the case of, so both boundaries uh, of the annulus uh, uh, have diverging uh, boundary conditions. So in that case, we get, uh, we should have uh, an expression for the one point function, which uh, is not constant, which diverges at the two boundaries, we have a magnetization profile similar, at least in shape, although for the different function to the ones that we have obtained here, which I believe should be the same thing that we would get from uh, from a theory. I'm saying so. Can I map uh, a strip to a half plane? Yes, and indeed uh, the map from strip to half plane should give you exactly. No, but Tim Swan said that I can only map yeah. half, half. Well, yes. Said, yeah. Yeah. That, that but, is uh, right. But then you have uh, boundary changing operators on the on the real line, right? Because suppose the two sides are okay. say, different oh, yes. boundary conditions, then yeah. you have an additional operator insertion. So that also introduces a non trivial cross ratio. Okay. So yeah. it's, it's equivalent. Yeah. Right. Well, yes. But, the, but, the but maybe, maybe its power. assumption would be that uh, that uh, operator is actually not there. That uh, since since he assumes that this boundary condition is the same on both sides of the strip. Yes, I, uh, it means that, that the this boundary is... changing operator is not there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our theory uh, right. cannot account for uh, boundary changing operators. So uh, all of this uh, is uh, assuming that uh, either boundary of the system has uh, uh, is uh, the same. So with uh, so the order parameter diverges the same way on both of the two boundaries. Yeah, so, so maybe as, as Slava was saying, this, this hypothesis maybe amounts to the statement that the boundary change operator is trivial because then, then you it would actually be a constant. I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat? Oh, uh, so yeah, so you assume that the two 
the two sides are the same boundary. So it's possible for the boundary change operator to be trivial. And if yeah. it's trivial, then uh, indeed you can you can map this, even if you have two sides, you can map it to still to just the disk one point function. And yes. then it makes sense for, for it to be constant. So so maybe that's the, the explanation for this hypothesis. In, in 2D. In, in 2D, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so in 2D, could we understand the hypothesis as equivalent to local conformal symmetry? And then in higher D, we would understand it as a gen higher D generalization of local conformal symmetry? Uh, well, that's, um, in a sense, uh, that, that seems to make uh, sense. I would say that uh, the main uh, the ingredients that we need to make our hypothesis are, well, scale invariance, which is uh, kind of trivial. It's uh, a lot less than requiring conformal invariance. And then uh, the fact that we can only allow conformal transformation of uh, our uh, metric. So uh, in a sense, we should uh, uh, only require uh, a global uh, conformal transformation, which is what uh, is also allowed uh, above uh, two dimensions. And How can it, you say this, Alessandra? This is just makes no sense. Because, okay, because you, uh, you make a, a very specific choice for, uh, for gamma x, which solves this Yamab equation. That is the, more, the important part of the hypothesis. Where does that Yamab equation come from, fraction Yamab equation? In two dimensions, that equation or what follows from that equation could be justified by appealing to local conformal transformation as it has been mentioned by Ying Song. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, do you have any theoretical understanding uh, from the principles that we know, like not just throwing hypothesis from uh, how to justify this fractional Yamabe equation? Uh, well, all the arguments that I had, I think I told them. There isn't, uh, we don't have any proof that uh, the, the fractional Yamab equation should be uh, the, the exact description of uh, models uh, in, say, uh, three dimensions. Hmm. Sorry, if I can add something, Slava. Sure, go ahead. Yes, uh, in a sense, what we what we are trying to do is to uh, what would you would you do in two dimensional system if, if you didn't know about uh, the Riemann mapping theorem? We are trying to do uh, this thing to construct this uh, kind of structure of many point function, which what you would do in your mind. Typically, you start with the domain. You cannot treat it, and you know the transformation laws. Uh, when you are uh, performing some conformal transformation. So you go back to the, to the nicest domain you know, that is the upper half space, and then you do your calculation and that's it. But would you be able to have this without, uh, no, without having, an, uh, let's say, a mapping back to the, to the nice domain? Uh, because that's the point, because in three dimension, you don't, you don't have such a, such a let's say, uh, such a mapping in general, unless- uh, What is so particularly nice by this domain that you get by rescaling with this gamma delta phi, which solves the Lamab equation? In two dimensions, we know that if we rescale with this gamma, we get a manifold, which is homogeneous. Yes. So it's a very nice manifold, and it's very clear that on that manifold, the one point function should be compact. What manifold do you get if you rescale by this gamma delta phi, which solves the Yamab equation? Why is it a nice manifold? It's a nice manifold. Okay, you don't you you you're not able to perform full uh, uniformization because you know you will no, never be able to put a three D manifold back to one uh, just with this conformal change. No, but explain to us why is this much. manifold any nicer than any other manifold? What is so nice about it? I I don't know what's nice about it. Exactly, that's the question. We have yes. to understand what's so nice about that, that manifold. Yes, but what we have <laughs> set up is some differential equation, let's say the simplest ever you can think of uh, that has good conformal, uh, conformal properties. Once we solve this, I can assure you that we just obtained some solution for the slab. By the same token, we get something that it's also a solution of two touching balls, okay? And I believe if this is correct, 
it should be also correct we don't bother to do the simulation because our our uh, uh, let's say our formalism is, is from the outset uh, uh, respectful of conformal symmetry when it is uh, when it is uh, but i don't know what is special about this is really you can think about it as the simple simplest equation that has good uh, transformation uh, under conformal uh, conformal maps that's it And that has okay the right scaling dimension, which is not. Uh, I wouldn't know which else term add to the Yamabe to the fractional Yamabe equation. If you have some suggestion, I, I have a question about the data. So you you Alessandro, you showed us that uh, using less folks, for example, on the easing model, you showed us that um, that okay you can do this plot and uh, you can determine delta phi. And if you you said that if you do this, try to do this feed with uh, with integer Yamabe, then of course, yeah. then things don't work. Mm -hmm. yeah. So can you mention uh, two things? First of all, what is the goodness of fit with using using fractional Yamabe and using integer Yamabe? And and what exactly goes wrong if you try to fit with integer Yamabe? Uh, all right, well, uh, in uh, all these cases, we had uh, quite uh, small errors, and uh, we know that the first uh, few points, which are uh, too close uh, to the boundary, will be um, too affected by finite size effect, and so we should uh, discard a few points which are close to the boundary, but we don't really know how many. So in order to, um, to determine this, we have uh, uh, fitted the points by using as their weights, both of course uh, their errors, one over the square of the respective errors, and also a function, which is uh, sort of a window function, so that the points in the center all have weight one, the points, uh, the first point at the boundary say has weight zero, and then this function ramps linearly from zero to one around a certain point t. And so we uh, moved this point, starting from the boundary and approaching the center, up until a point where uh, the chi-square, the, um, the residues of the fit, are small enough. And uh, the value that we chose to be, to be something that we consider small enough is the value of chi-square corresponding to a p-value of uh, 0.95. So all those fits have uh, the same uh, uh, goodness of the fit, uh, which is uh, determined in uh, this way. Uh, but, but I don't understand. Why do you have to introduce this T parameter? Because you already allowed for deviation from uh, near the boundary by introducing this A over L in your formula. So well, why do yes, you have now to allow all this T? Well, even uh, including that extrapolation length, we still have that uh, the first uh, few points uh, have uh, a uh, much smaller error, but at the same time, they are more influenced by uh, finite size effects. So we cannot uh, include uh, literally every point uh, in, uh, in our domain. And okay, this but, is the way. But in practice, like, okay, if you just have to exclude a few points, I don't care. If you like have to exclude half, half the space. No, no it's, it's always very few points. So it's uh, okay. uh, no more than uh, three points uh, out of, let's like, say, 100. So the number of points excluded, I would say actually a couple of points. We did this just uh, to avoid doing something too arbitrary. We could have said, yeah, let's ignore the first uh, three points, uh, but okay. then you could ask why exactly three, and this is how we chose exactly how many points to exclude. Okay, and so and so with this procedure, you can get a good chi-square with fractional Yamabe. Yes. I, do you get good chi-square with integer Yamabe, or you just don't get good chi-square? Uh, it's uh, a lot worse. I don't think I have uh, the actual numbers here. Uh, but uh, it's at least, uh, if I remember correctly, at least one order of magnitude uh, higher than the uh, fractional uh, Yamabe solution. Okay. So both uh, uh, any measure of goodness of fit and uh, the values of uh, delta phi suggest us that uh, the integer Yamabe is uh, not the uh, best choice. And also the fit uh, of the spin spin correlation function. If you do with the metric uh, calculated from the integer Yamabe, that's 
worst much worse. but guys you don't you understand i mean already the one point function is completely amazing if you if you have if you are uh, correct yeah, the already one point function is already miraculous and it's correct if you say like okay but let's consider like two point function oh, because the, so forget the, about two point function if you can yeah, show yeah. that why one point function works this is already amazing it's just like to, uh, going to be the major to, discovery just to add a piece of information just to tell yeah. you that uh, if you brutally try to fit the, the spin spin uh, then you are off uh, and you don't have that uh, precision okay. that come naturally with the with the fractional yamabe delta phi okay i see there is a question from antonio antunes can you go ahead antonio yeah thanks so can you use this uniformization to compute one point functions on a wedge, for example, because a wedge, okay, it's not a bounded domain, but there is more that you can say from conformal invariance because there is still some uh, conformal invariance in the perpendicular direction to the wedge. So this would need to satisfy some crossing equations and so on. It would be a good test. Uh, I'm sorry, what do you mean by a wedge? Intersecting boundaries that make a certain angle theta. Okay, okay. Uh, well, that would be surely uh, a lot more difficult. At least in principle, uh, it should be possible, so long as uh, the, the two boundaries have the, the same uh, uh, boundary condition. So say again, the, diverge, the param order parameter diverges, it uh, should be possible to uh, compute uh, the solution of a Yamaha or even fraction Yamaha equation on uh, such a boundary. In, uh, the, the best case would be if uh, uh, it was possible to find a map from something like uh, a half space uh, to something like a wedge, but uh, uh, I don't think that this can be done in... I mean, in 2D, you can use D to the power yeah. alpha and you can do yeah. it, right? Yeah, it's nice that it, in 2D of course it can be done, but I'm not, I don't think that this generalizes uh, beyond 2D. So uh, I believe that if you, uh, since in 2D it's just a map from a half plane to a different uh, geometry, it should work in the sense that you could, uh, it should be equivalent to solving the UV equation and then you would get at uh, least a one point function uh, of the field inside uh, this web. It, it should work, yeah. But in 3D it's again the non-trivial uh, state. Yeah. But, yeah. Sorry, just to add, uh, the last thing you would uh, you would not simulate actually this because the wedge for simulation is bad. You don't want to go to infinity. Oh uh, yeah, but okay, it, it should be interesting. You can map it again. Uh, you can send some infinity back uh, to some. It should be two uh, two spheres, uh, uh, not tangent, but having a circle intersection. Uh, this could be interesting. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? So in the very old days, 70s and maybe the beginning of the 80s, people developed uh, theories of finite size scaling, of magnetization profiles close to a boundary. So names like Kurt Binder comes to my mind. I'm, it's not a literature that I'm extremely well acquainted with. So there's a review. Uh, so is it something that that comes out here, you could make a comparison with that or uh, uh, see at least how you refine that kind of, uh, of, well, that kind uh, of information. Yeah, well, we um, read uh, a bit of uh, that literature and uh, in some cases, uh, there were some, uh, indeed, some magnetization profiles. Uh, most of the ones that we found were uh, at, uh, consider, were computed at the mean field level. So they would be equivalent uh, to the um, integer Yamabe solution. Uh, we found them for uh, D equals four, so for a five-four theory, also for a five-six theory in three dimensions. And so there, there were some magnetization profile already known, which we, uh, in a sense, just uh, expressed in a, a more uh, general uh, framework. Uh, many other works of that time uh, were mainly concerned with uh, things like uh, surface uh, exponents, uh, which uh, is uh, not exactly uh, our aim, uh, since uh, 
for us the boundary is just something with the fixed spins uh, uh, and nothing interesting from our point of view is happening on these our boundaries. So a few of those works indeed uh, have uh, results that we uh, that are compatible with what we're doing. Others are a different uh, uh, region of the study of boundary critical phenomena. Okay, so another relatively minor comment is that uh, for three-dimensional percolation, I believe that people can now do the epsilon expansion to six loops, and you only cited the five-loop result. Oh, uh, yes, I was unaware of this uh, update. I'll, I'll check this out. Thank you. Okay, so... I think this is a quite an amazing uh, discovery and I think everyone, all theoreticians who think they understand anything about 3D CFT, they should try to understand what's going on here. Why, is this, why does this work so amazingly? Should be some reason behind this uh, fractional Yamabe. Uh, with this uh, comment, if there is no other questions? Uh, I think we should thank Alessandro for this thought-provoking presentation. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. and I guess uh, we can we can close the session. And uh, tomorrow we have a talk at ten, I think, um, by Andrea Capelli. So I'll 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 stop the recording and uh, people in the cathedral please and close. I will uh, stop the Zoom. Thank you. Bye -bye. Cheers. Thank you, Alessandro. A good luck for uh, Giacomo is becoming father. So. Good luck, Giacomo. Good luck, Giacomo.